Okay, so on the topic of centrifuges, centrifuges are uh, a, another unit operation that are very common across a variety of industries. So this is something that almost all of you will likely encounter in your career, and especially those of you that are in the bio area. So this is a, a bio separation unit as well. A variety of references are, are available for this, and um, there's, there's some here that are better than others, but the Perry's one is really good for you to read through, and, and I, I recommend that. The area of centrifuges is fairly varied. Again, centrifuges specifically for bioproducts, centrifuges for liquid from liquid, liquids from solids, gas from gas. There's a little bit of subtlety there, and so I'll, I'll, I'll show a few of those examples for, for you. <laughs> And the main reason why we use a centrifuge is when we consider sedimentation, we were just using gravity. But at some point, gravity does not provide enough energy for us. Gravity is our ESA, our energy separating agent. But that, gravity separ uh, that uh, gravitational force that we're getting for free is often not powerful enough, particularly when it comes to smaller particles and when it comes to the case of small density differences. So recall in sedimentation, the reason why particles sediment out is not because they're larger, larger size or because it's solid versus liquid. Particles separate in a liquid or in a fluid, I should say, because there's a density difference. But if you had a solid particle that was very close in density to the liquid environment that it's in, um, that particle is not going to separate so fast. So, when our free gravity force is not strong enough, we need to give some more force. And the easiest way to apply that is in a rotating device, like a centrifuge. Um, sometimes gravity, even though it might be good enough to settle the particle, if our particles are too small, okay, so even if you've got a particle of a high density relative to the fluid that it's in, but if it's a small particle, that particle is going to be bounced around by Brownian motion, very, very minor heat disturbances will set up convection currents and that will move those particles around. And there's other forces that are at play. And when we were looking at sedimentation, a few of you had mentioned chemical forces, pH and surface forces. And those are sometimes, or those are always found when we're looking at emulsions. So an emulsion, we've all seen emulsions. An emulsion is mayonnaise. Okay, mayonnaise is a classic example of an emulsion. You've got water droplets suspended in, in fat. So oil and egg. Okay. I'll show you an example of mayonnaise being separated out in a centrifuge in a minute. But that's a classic emulsion, is mayonnaise. Those small particles are being stabilized by those chemical forces. Now, let me ask you this then. Um, don't think about mayonnaise. Think about other particles, right? Other solid fluid separations. Why don't we just apply flocculants and get larger particle sizes and separate out? Think about that for a minute. Uh, discuss it with someone next to you. Why don't we just apply flocculation and then use free sedimentation? Right? So the gravity is always free. Why don't we just flocculate and use gravity? Anyone want to, any group want to give some ideas? Yes? Uh, it's too expensive. It's flocculation is too expensive. Yes, Helen. Okay, so if you're going to flocculate, particularly say for a bio separation where the solids are, the, are of interest to be that you want to recover later on, 
Now you're going to have to separate your solids from the flocculants in a subsequent step. Okay. Even, any other suggestions? Yes? Uh, it's not fast enough. A flocculant might still not give you the fast enough uh, separation. The other case might be if you're interested in the liquid phase as your valuable component that you're trying to recover, now you've contaminated your liquid phase with the flocculant as well, with a dissolved flocculant. And as Helen mentioned, you now have to have a subsequent separation from the liquid and the flocculant. Okay? So flocculation introduces an, an MSA. You're adding a new species to your system. It's very hard to separate one MSA from the rest of your mass. An ESA that's being added to your system is a whole lot easier to separate. You actually don't have to separate it, right? An ESA is just creating your separation for you without introducing a new species. Okay, so centrifuges are an ESA way of causing a separation, whereas a flocculant is an MSA. The other thing why centrifuges are so useful is that they are, happen at ambient temperatures or the temperatures you're dealing with, which is really important for biosystems as well. Okay? A biosystem, you don't want to heat up the liquid phase or the solid phase. That causes a destabilization in the environment and damages the product you're dealing with. So centrifuges can operate at ambient conditions and cause that uh, separation for us. So here's the picture that you can have in mind. Um, you may have all seen a lab centrifuge. It looks as follows. You um, have a number of, of holes here in this device. And I'm just showing two. They're always symmetrical. You always want a perfect balance inside this device. There's high forces going on. So you need to always um, have a symmetrical balance in this device. And what the centrifuge will do is, after placing your sample in a container, it will spin it around. The solids that will separate out at the bottom edge there or is called a precipitate. The clearer liquid is called a supernatant. That's left over. Okay, so some. Sometimes you'll see the precipitate called, referred to as a pellet because it, it's formed a solid pellet at the bottom there. And then you get your clarified liquid as the supernatant. The suspension is the term we give to the mixture that you add to the centrifuge tube when you start. So that suspension then gets separated into two pieces, a precipitate and a supernatant. Okay, so that's terminology. New terminology in this course is always shown with that color over there when I introduce a new term for the first time. Okay, so let's, um, let's maybe take a look at mayonnaise separating. Um, YouTube seems to have all sorts of interesting videos. Let's just... Okay, so let me repeat that maybe again with the lights off. So there's someone adding mayonnaise to, a, to one of those centrifuge tubes. An hour later, at very high rotational speeds, it separates out into the two components. The more dense component was water, which separated out at the far edge, and the lighter component, the, the, the fat, separated at the top. Okay, so there's a variety of other interesting YouTube videos on centrifuging that you can go look at. Um, the key idea here, as you saw with mayonnaise, is you're separating a liquid from a liquid. You can separate liquid from solid, you can even separate one gas from another gas in a centrifuge. I'll show you what that looks like. The other reason why centrifuges are used is because it, it often causes a drying effect for us. Those particles that are flung to the extreme edge are now drained of fluid, and so the subsequent drying step from that solid is cheaper. So the centrifuge gets us uh, closer to a more dry solid, and you could see centrifuging used, for example, on separating cream from the milk, um, clarification of juices and beers to remove yeast particles would be an alternative. You don't want to heat up your beer and, cause a uh, and apply a temperature gradient there. So again, ambient conditions, centrifuging works really well. Bioseparations, all the time, those, uh, those centrifuges are seen in, in laboratories and bioseparations, and um, it's now also being used increasingly for separating oil sands is, is one way of, of cleaning up those heavy oils. So here is um, 
an interesting article that you can go read on Wikipedia about the zip type centrifuge where they're separating one gas from another gas. Okay? The gas difference in density is only 1.26%. Very, very small difference in density. And so you need these operating in countercurrent in these long banks because each stage is just getting a very small separation for you and then you stack them in countercurrent to get the overall separation requirement. These devices spin so rapidly that even fingerprints on the device will destabilize it. Okay. The process control behind this is phenomenally complex to keep that device stable and there was that incident a few years ago where uh, one government sabotaged another government's separation steps in this, these types of centrifuges with the computer virus that just caused minor instability in those centrifuges and, and caused them to fail. Okay? So they're operating at really, really high rotational speeds. I'll show you just how fast they're rotating in the next, um, in the next section. So there's gas from gas separation. So let's get an idea for centrifugal forces. Okay, we've all, you've all done this, right? You've all tied a stone or something to the end of a string and you swing it around. Right? We've all done this as kids. What do you feel when you're doing that? What force, which directions do the forces do you experience? Pulls outward. Pulls outward. Okay, so there's a force being throw, flung out. Okay, that's our centrifugal force. Centrifugal, the F-U-G-E, fugue is a Latin word for fly. It's flying outward. So centrifugal is flying outward, and that's the force that's operating on that. It's a force that is proportional to m times a, and a, the acceleration in this case, is r omega squared. So if you're that's your center point and you've got a device being flung out. Omega is your angular velocity and R is that radius. Okay. So we know our radius. In a centrifuge we know where our center point is. Okay. We know the, the diameter of our centrifuge, we know our radius of the centrifuge and we know the speed, the angular velocity at which we're rotating that centrifuge. So we can calculate that centrifugal force. Okay. So here's, here's one thing I want you to think about. When we're dealing with these forces, let's, let's work in SI units. And the SI unit for this is the hertz. Okay, one hertz. One hertz is one ro full rotation per second. So if you take one second and you do a complete rotation, okay, that's a hertz. One rotation per second. The distance that, oh, sorry, the amount that you've traveled by is two omega radians per second. So one hertz is, uh, sorry, two pi, not two omega, two pi radians per second is one hertz. So that's the SI unit. Radians per second starts to tell us how we're going to move to a different set of units. And the other last step is one radian per second gets you 9.55 revolutions per minute. The reason why I want to point this out is very often you'll see people talking about revolutions per minute, RPMs. So we've heard of RPMs, right? Material, uh, uh, sorry, engines or devices rotating at revolutions per minute, RPMs. But RPM is not SI. And our equations that we're going to use are in SI units. So let's get comfortable with converting revolutions per minute into SI units. Okay. So that, that's the link over there, 9.55 RPMs. is equal to one radian per second. Okay. And two pi radians per second is one hertz. 
So I'm just multiplying by a sequence of ones over here, as you normally do in, uh, in your 2D course. 9.55 RPMs is equivalent to one radians per second, but two pi radians per second is equal to one hertz. You can use that, simplify it a little bit, and link RPM then to hertz. Okay. Now let's get, uh, and I'll let you do that in an example coming up soon. But let's get a feel for revolutions per minute. I, let's just deal with the non-SI unit. We'll, let's go back to RPMs for a minute. Because it's used so prevalently, I want you to get a feel for order of magnitude. Okay, so if you're sitting in a vehicle and you're at the traffic light, it's red, and you want to turn left, okay, so you're in the, let's, let's consider you're not driving. You're taking a taxi or your parents are driving you. You're in the back seat. Lights turn green, you're going to take a left corner. Who's going to experience the largest centrifugal force? The passenger in the back left or the passenger in the back right? Okay, so there's the traffic light, you're in the vehicle. Passenger A or passenger B going to experience the largest centrifugal force? B, okay, so the ra rotation is going to be in this direction. There's your radius distance. Passenger B has a larger radius than passenger A. Okay, R omega squared. Okay, how much is that force? Well, it's about 15 to 20 uh, RPMs. So if that car just kept going in circles, that's about the speed that you can do. It's about 10 to 15 revolutions per minute. Cars probably won't go much faster than that. Because that's a very slow RPM, and it's equivalent to about one or two times gravity. Now, your washing machine at home, that on the spin cycle is going at about 1,500 revolutions per minute. So your clothing in the washing machine is experiencing about 600 times the force of gravity to separate that liquid from the, from the solid. An industrial centrifuge is going just under, typically under 15,000. And so there's the G's experienced, okay. if that centrifuge is about 0.1 meter. Now, a, lo a lab centrifuge, these are much smaller devices, and we can spin those much faster in a more controlled way. And so their number of G's is about 100,000. Okay. That centrifuge I showed you that was separating one uranium gas from another uranium gas isotope, that's going much, much faster, 90,000 revolutions per minute, a million Gs, and the tip speed right at the end of that centrifuge is going twice the speed of sound. Okay? So that's why very careful control is required to make sure that those devices stay exactly inside those shells. Any movement in them and it's going to touch something else is going to break, break the device. Yeah. How large are um, we'll, see, we'll show some pictures of those coming up. Yeah. Okay. So that gives you an idea for the centrifuges. Now, perhaps let me just end off with a video that shows the motion of fluid in a centrifuge. So I do not ever recommend you do what this guy is doing. What I want you to focus on is the shape that the liquid takes. Okay, so just pause that. So the wall of water was vertical. As he slows it down, the wall of water starts to get this triangular shape. And now he's going to speed it up again.
Okay, don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll, uh, we'll take a look at what the particles do inside that centrifuge in next week's class.